Good to see all of you. It's uh, great to be here this morning. Wonderful day. We're going to finish our, um, our series on the, on the kingdom. I hope it's been informative to you. I hope we've learned some things. Everything is online. Go back and listen. This is important stuff, and I, I, I don't want for you to just sort of dismiss it as just like theological boilerplate. This is really important stuff. Jesus spoke more about the kingdom than he did anything else. I mean, this is, he constantly talked about the kingdom, and we don't talk about the kingdom much. We talk about heaven. We talk about sin. We talk about behavior. We talk about a lot of things, and certainly those are things we need to be speaking of, but Jesus' obsession was with the kingdom. It should be be our obsession as well. So sometimes it, we can get a little bit enmeshed in, uh, in theological terminology, and I hope that hasn't been the case. I hope it's been practical enough that we end up with something that we know uh, and we learn about the kingdom. And if, and if you need to kind of backtrack, maybe listen to some more of those messages. Um, much of the teaching comes from George Eldon Ladd's uh, seminal work on the, on the kingdom. It's a simple read, um, and I would be happy to direct you to that resource if you need to do a little bit more reading and to study on it. But let's learn what this kingdom is. It's important. It begs the question, what is it? Is it, you know, is it the church? Is it a nation? Is it, is it, is it people? You know, we need to know what it is. And one of the things that we learned is that the kingdom of God is best understood in the rule and the reign of Christ, the authority of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> Jesus told a story in one of his parables of a king leaving to receive his kingdom. Uh, in other words, the king was leaving to go to a greater king to receive authority in the region that he was to rule. And he, he uh, told it as a parable, and it's paralleling a story that happened a few decades before Christ's own life, where Herod the Great had gone to Rome to receive authority to rule, uh, rule Palestine. And so Jesus drew from a story that, that his community, his culture would know really well. So in other words, we understand the kingdom. When we speak of the kingdom, it's the rule and the reign of Christ. It's, uh, it's the authority of Jesus. And, um, and that's what we want to see spread through us. Not a nation, it's not a people. We are people of the kingdom, but we're not the kingdom, are we? We're people under the rule and the reign of Jesus. He's our king, he's our authority. And so this is, this is one of the things that we learn about the kingdom. We've also learned that the kingdom has a future orientation. It's something that's coming, that's gonna be fulfilled entirely in a, in a day that it still remains to be seen. But, we, but, it, but it reaches into my life right now, doesn't it? I have authority as as a, as a person of the kingdom, I have authority over sin, over death, over darkness, over Satan. I'm not bound by those things anymore. I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. So it reaches into my life now to gain victory. Jesus told his people, I'm not gonna leave you orphans. I'm giving you my spirit. I'm giving you my authority. I'm giving you my mission. I'm giving you my word. God is a God who gives and gives and gives and gives. And if we're gonna be like him, we need to learn to give and give and give and give well. And the more we give, the more God gives us to give. It's the way the kingdom works. So I'm not left an or orphan. I'm left with authority. I'm left with power. I'm left with victory. As I'm going through this age, this church age, what Jesus, the, we're in this evil age now is what Jesus calls it. And, and the church sort of settles into the midst of that to be salt and light, to be encouragement to people. But we are in an age that's ruled by the prince of this age or, or, or Satan. Now, his power is broken. He's a defeated enemy, but he's still powerful. Peter described him as a roaring lion looking to consume us. Now think about that for a while. There is a, we have an enemy who wants to destroy us, doesn't like us, wants to see our failure. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be cautious. We also learned that the kingdom is going to come in three great installments. Now, I have argued, uh, I've argued for what we call uh, premillennial, uh, premillennialism, and I don't want to, again, bog you down with a lot of theological terms, and if your theological orientation is different than mine, that's fine. We're not going to come to blows out in the parking lot or something over this. This, this. These are complicated issues, and frankly, the Bible doesn't speak with specificity on this is what's going to happen. It'd be great if, if the Bible went, well, it's like this and this and this and this and this. There's places that come close, places like Thessalonians and Corinthians, Corinthians and Matthew and in, in Revelation, things that begin to identify what's going to, but you have to kind of put the, the pieces of the puzzle together as you, uh, as, as, as you interpret God's word, as you interpret the scripture, as you interpret it through the lens of Christ, it's complicated. There's different ideas. There's premillennialism, which I am, which believes that 
Christ is going to come before the millennium, and then we're going to reign with him for a thousand years, and then there's going to be the final inauguration where death and Satan are defeated, and, and the kingdom is, is, is uh, established in its final form. There's uh, all millennialism, which says that Jesus is going to come somewhere in the, in the millennial reign. Much of the language is metaphorical, and we mostly don't worry too much about it. We just know he's coming someday. And then there's other people that believe in post-millennialism that says we're in the... We're going to come into that millennial season, and some people believe we're in it now, and at the end of it, Christ will return, and his kingdom will be established. Um, so lots of different, and then within those ideas, there's, there's uh, an idea called preterism that exists within post, uh, post-millennialists that says that all of the events that are eschatological in nature have already happened. We don't need to worry too much about it. And then within premillennialism, there's historic premillennialism, of which I am, um, and that I adhere to. And then there's uh, dispensational premillennialism, which a lot of us grew up with. If you've read Hal Lindsey, or you've read Schofield, or you've read... Um, you know, uh, watch the, the Left Behind movies or seen that, then that's dispensational premillennialism. And a lot of us have that orientation. Now, all of that to say, don't worry too much about it. Study it, learn from it, grow from it, but don't, don't, you know, don't ruin yourself over it. Sometimes people just become so obsessed. The fact of the matter is we just don't really know all that much but, uh, or that's with that specificity. But I do believe in historic premillennialism. And again, I lo- forgot my little pointer, so I'm going to point with my finger, which my mother told me not to do. But if we could get that screen on there, guys, that would be helpful. Um, I believe that this current age we are in is the this age. Jesus called it the evil age. The church age sort of comes into the middle of that. And the kingdom comes in three great installments. The first one is Jesus' advent, his death, his resurrection, um, where he breaks the power of sin. He mitigates the the power of Satan. Um, He he breaks the power of death. And even though we experience those things still, we're not bound by them anymore. We're given authority. We're given power. We're given uh, um, uh, victory over the things of our world that are dark and and that harm us. So this is the first great installment of, of, the, of the kingdom. The kingdom then reaches into our world now. Um, we believe in the second coming of Christ. Jesus is going to return. That's the second great installment of the kingdom, where, which will initiate the millennial reign. Um, in this time, uh, uh, Satan will be bound uh, the, the power of death will still be a part of the millennial kingdom. Other people that don't know Jesus will still die in it. They'll still be given opportunity to come to faith. We will reign with Jesus. According to Revelation 20, we will reign with him throughout this millennial period. Um, at the end of that period, uh, we were told in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that, and also in Revelation 20 that the final enemy to be destroyed is death. Satan will be released at the end of that period. For a short period, there'll be a final rebellion upon which he will be then thrown into the the lake of fire and destroyed along with those that don't believe. And sin is the last enemy that will be defeated. And that's when the final kingdom in its its completion will be fully uh, inaugurated. And that's that's the eternal state. So that's that's a basic uh, classic or historical premillennialism, and that's what, that's what I believe. And again, if, if it's something that you go, that's a little bit different than I was taught or that I believe, that's fine. Do some reading, do some studying on it. You will benefit from it. Um, but it's complicated, and there is a ton. Hector has been to seminary and all kinds of studying, and there's a lot, isn't there? And you can chase endless rabbit trails. You can go to conference after conference. You can do so much. It's a good pursuit, but I'm just going to deal with one verse. One verse today. I know it's uncharacteristic of me to only deal with one verse, but there's only one verse in the Bible that definitively says, here's when this is going to happen. Because if you're like me, you want to know, all right, Jesus, tell me, when's it coming? I, I need to be ready, right? This was, this was the same, this was the case with uh, his believers in the first century. They said the same thing. In Matthew 24, we read about this. Jesus, when is all of this going to come? So he begins to talk through them. And you might go through and read uh, Matthew 24 to kind of get Jesus' language. But, it's, but he begins to speak of there's going to be there's going to be a lot of tribulation. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard on the church. There's going to be persecution. People are going to be martyred. There's going to be a great turning away from the church because, it, because of that persecution. 
Jesus says the days will be short because if I didn't shorten the days, you wouldn't be able to endure it. So he kind of paints a pretty dire picture. And then in the middle of it, he's gonna continue in Matthew 24 and into 25, speaking of, of, of how difficult and complicated this is gonna be, but in the midst of it, Matthew 24, verse 14, here's what he says. He goes, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. There's a lot of things we can look at. You can look at passages in Daniel and other prophets. You can look, as I said, in the writings of, of Paul and, and uh, in his letters. You can look at the writings of John and Revelation. There's a lot of things that we can look at and speculate, but there's only one verse that definitively says, this is when the end will happen. Now, in, in saying that, there are a lot of things within this verse that we need to take seriously and have embedded deeply into heart. Because here in this very simple statement, we are told the message, we're given the mission, and we're given the motive of why we exist, why the kingdom exists, what are we here to do. And we need to understand it. We need to be able to kind of have it riveted in our hearts so that we know what the behavior of people of the kingdom is to, is to look like. The first part of it is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world. What is the gospel? And specifically, what is the gospel of the kingdom? People have different ideas on that, and there's, there's some, some different speculation. In our Western world, we tend to sort of truncate the gospel. We tend to sort of take, the, the uh, uh, I think, an overly simplistic view. But most of us have heard something to this effect. The gospel of Christ is that you're a sinner. Um, you need to be saved so that you don't go to hell. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And then you get to go to heaven and be with him. Now, all of those things are true. But it's just a little, tiny little picture, isn't it? Just this much. The gospel is much broader. And I'll be honest with you, that never really captured my heart. As a young guy, I didn't know, uh, you know, if God's angry, I'm a sinner, I'm going to go to hell, Jesus died, so I don't have to, I get to go to heaven, and, you know, I kind of had my ideas and concepts of that. I grew up in church, I grew up in a pastor's home, but that's not what gripped my heart. My, what gripped my heart was the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the bigger narrative, the broader narrative, the narrative that Jesus is not just going to provide a way for us to be with him for eternity, Every religion has some sort of concept of eternity. Every religion has some sort of concept of heaven. The, the, the theology of the, of the kingdom is much deeper than that. It says, no, I'm not just providing you a way out. I'm defeating death. I'm defeating sin. I'm defeating Satan. I'm getting rid of it. I am going to redeem your bodies as well as your soul. You're gonna live your life through this present age empowered by my spirit until one day I'm gonna raise you from the dead and then we're gonna reign forever throughout the millennium until the final, the final act is the destruction of Satan, the destruction of sin, and then we're gonna reign throughout all eternity. So in other words, the gospel of the kingdom is the defeat of everything that's wrong in our world, in our lives. It's the complete reversal of all of the effects of sin. It's, it's paradise restored. It's the, it's, it's the intimate knowledge, what we see only now through a veil. There's a day when God removes it and we will know God the way he knows us. It's deep, it's personal, it's embedded into history and time. That's the gospel. We tend to think of the gospel as something spoken. We tend to say, we say, preach the gospel. When I was a young guy and I'd hear about evangelism, as it probably does you, it would intimidate me because I didn't know the words. I grew up around theologians and academics and they could speak way better than I could. And I didn't, I didn't understand all of the ologies. I didn't understand, you know, eschatology and uh, uh, ecclesiology and pneumatology and all the ologies. I didn't feel like I was smart enough to do it. And I always thought to myself, well, if I just learn this, if I could just learn this, if I could learn a little bit more about this, then I can have, I can, I can be effective. I can tell people about Jesus. 
But that's because in our Western world, we tend to think about propositional truth. If I just explain it to you in careful enough terms, then you'll be able to make a logical response to it. But that's not really what happened in Scripture. In fact, there's a good example in Acts where Philip, the great, the great deacon of the church, was sent divinely by the Spirit of God to go to Samaria and to preach the gospel. As he went there to preach the gospel, preaching the gospel as he went. But the, but the way we translate it in English is kind of a difficult concept because we don't have the word that, that was used there, that Luke writing in Greek would use. He uses the word that, that in gospel has the same idea as a verb as it does as a noun. So a more literal translation, and not just in this place, but in other places, he went gospeling. We don't really have a word for it in our, in our vocabulary. The closest would be like to preach the gospel or to evangelize, but he went gospeling. In other words, it was this activity of bringing the good news of the kingdom wherever he went. Now that implies more than just speaking. It implies more than coming in and just sort of you know, declaring. Certainly there's that aspect of declaration that's important, but it was, it's to be our whole life. My whole life is to be gospeling in every aspect of my life. One of the things that I find so remarkable about our church is that on any given Friday or Saturday night throughout our community, there's, there's a dozen musicians playing, really, really good ones all over our community. That's the kingdom, people. Imagine if we did that in every sphere of our life, if in politics, in academia, in business, in military, in law enforcement, in, in, in media, in, uh, in, in, the, in the arts, if in every pillar of our society, we had dozens of people deeply involved in each one of those things, gospeling as they went. See, we tend to think of, of, of the work of the gospel being done by a preacher, but it's much more than that. You, you can't help but see the parallel of this particular passage and, and what Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven in Matthew 28. You remember what he said? He said, all authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go to all the nations and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them the things that I've taught you. And I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. Very similar language. And we think of these great apostles But they weren't. They were just some roughneck Galileans, fishermen, young guys. What's a little town around here? What's the smallest little town around here? Which one? Keithsburg? I don't even know what Keithsburg is. How many of y'all know what Keithsburg is? Little town called, let's, let's take Keithsburg. Let's say Jesus took, how, anybody actually from Keithsburg? Anybody? Do you know anybody from Keith? Let's, let's say you're from Keithsburg, and, and Jesus took 12 of your buddies. You're all about the same age. You're all in your late teens, early 20s. He says, I'm leaving. And I want you guys to take the gospel to the ends of the world. Can you imagine the impact? If it were me, and I'm from Keithsburg, I'm from Galilee. I'm going, are you kidding me? I went to high school with that guy. We were drinking hams out of my dad's pickup truck. <laughs> I'm not taking the gospel to the ends of the world. That would be ridiculous. I'm from a little town. That's what he did. This is, in other words, it's beyond us. We can't do it. It's beyond us. But he said it's this gospel of the kingdom. In other words, it wasn't their words. It wasn't what, it was, it was them gospeling of the kingdom. So that's the first thing. We have a message. We have a powerful message. The message of the gospel is Christ's complete victory over sin, over death, over hell, over everything, of all of the undoing, all of the, the harm of the world, everything, every pain that we suffer. Every, we, our world is marred by death. It's marred by uh, hate. It's marred by division, wars, all of those things. It's giving us, the gospel gives us authority over those things. It gives us victory. That's the first thing. We have a compelling message. We'll be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. That's the second part of it. Here's our, here's our uh, mission given to us. It's not optional. 
We don't ever get to say, Jesus didn't say, gosh, it'd be nice if you do this. He says, you go do it. He says, you go do it because all authority has been given to me. Now you go. As my father sent me, now I'm sending you, he said. Go into all the world. Preaching this gospel as a testimony to all nations. That the aspect of testimony is important because the only way these 12 young guys, and one of them tanked, by the way, the only way these young guys could do it is because they had a testimony. They had something in it. It wasn't, it wasn't how compelling their words are. In fact, we know that Peter spoke well. He was the oldest of disciples. We know John, who was the youngest, he, he spoke. You know, he had authority. He spoke. They all had authority. They would go into these communities, but we don't really hear much more about Matthew. They all kind of went to different places, and, 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 and they would speak or write, but, but we don't really hear of these great you know, open door preachers. That's not really what it seemed like they did. They would go into these communities gospeling because they had something in them. First of all, they had power. They had the power of the gospel. And they had this internal testimony, the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That's the most compelling aspect of it. In other words, I can know a lot of things about Jesus, but I can have no testimony of him. I can say lots of facts about Jesus, but I may not know him at all. The internal witness of the Spirit is kind of the whole thing, really. And it doesn't require a lot of uh, fancy degrees and theological training to speak of that internal witness. I mean, it doesn't. It's the, it's when, to put it in sort of our vernacular, it's when, it's when Christ comes into our heart, into our life, changing us, giving us divine life, giving us his divine power, giving us his divine mission, all of those divine things that happen. And when that happens in a person's life, I never really worry about them because they have this internal witness. Now, there are, there, there are so many rabbit trails in life a person can, can talk. And, and I talk with people all the time. They go, well, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And what about this YouTube thing that I saw? And what about this book? Right? And then I can answer this, and I can answer that, and I can give them this book, and I can say, well, that YouTube, it's YouTube, so how much are you going to get from that? And I can kind of do, I can keep, and we can keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they can present every argument, and you can answer them as well as you can. The rabbit trails will never end until the work of divine life is done the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, that thing that makes us alive. When that happens, there's no doubt that that person is saved, whatever his theological orientation, and that he's been given life or she's been given life. It's the thing that when you're walking, as David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're right there with me. There's that little tap on your heart that says, I'm still right here with you. It's that little thing, there's there's that sense of peace that we can go through the storms and the pain, the travail of life, and there's that internal witness. It does not take a theologian to speak of that, does it? It's just saying something has happened in my heart. And in fact, I think it's more powerful when it comes from somebody who's not one. Theologians just tend to complicate it too much the internal witness. What happens is these young men went into their communities, into their regions, and began to share this this internal witness, and they preached, and they delivered, and they healed, and they served, and they worked. The church began to grow because then the witness became somebody else's witness, and the witness became somebody else's witness, and the witness became somebody else's witness, and it just began to grow like that. It says in the first century that God added to their numbers daily because of this simple thing. Without the internal witness, the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, none of this is possible. It's, it's completely beyond any of us. A testimony to all nations. Testimonies have a lot to do with proximity, which is why Jesus said, start with Jerusalem, then go to Samaria. The Samaria was not just sort of an adjunct place. They hated the Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. So, so for Jesus to say, start with your village, start with your people, then go to people you really hate, 
then I'm going to grow your authority. I'm going to build your spiritual authority. Then you can go to your region, to your community, your state, your county, your, your country, and then you'll go to the whole world. Maybe that should be each of our model. Let's start in our career. Let's, let's reach our Jerusalem first. Then let's reach out to people that don't like us and we don't like them. Let's reach out to our Samaritans. And then maybe God will grow our authority so that we can reach our region and then reach the world. But it all happens with the proximity of my testimony and your testimony. No words will do this. St. Francis of Assisi said something to the effect, and maybe I'm going to butcher this, but preach the gospel and if necessary, use words, something to that effect. In other words, we're to be gospeling everywhere we go and in every aspect of our lives, living out the love and the grace and the passion of Jesus. So that was the second thing. That's our message, or that's our mission. The message is the, is the gospel, the, 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 uh, the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus overcomes sin and death and rights all of the wrongs in the world at the com- in the coming kingdom. It's the gospel of the kingdom. As a testimony, that inner testimony, the witness that we have as, divine, as divinely empowered people. And then the end will come. Our gospel tends to stop too short. We tend to say, you know, what you need is Jesus. You know, if people are having hard times and difficult times, I just prayed with a dear woman this morning going through terrible stuff, and, and, and the temptation to say, well, you need Jesus. That person may come to Jesus, right? They may have, they may find faith, but that, does that end their problems? It doesn't really, does it? I came to faith, did that end my problems? No. Nope. There's, still, there's still sin. We still have an enemy. There's still death. There's still job loss. There's still loved ones that struggle, isn't there? There's all those things. So just because I came to faith doesn't mean all the problems of the world are done. We tend to, we tend to make too short a view of the gospel. We say, well, if you just find Jesus, everything will be made right. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, if my gospel has been preached to the whole world, then the problems are done away with. Then the problems are made right. So we preach the gospel to bring hope, to give strength, to bind up the brokenhearted, to to help them in their time of need, to empower them by the Holy Spirit. But we, in the end, that doesn't eradicate sin, that doesn't eradicate death, that doesn't destroy Satan. It breaks their power, but it doesn't destroy them. In the end, what destroys those things is the gospel of the kingdom being preached to the whole world. Then it's destroyed. Then the end will come. So we have to take the longer view. If I hate the pain that I live in, if I hate to see the ravages of sin and death, of war, of hate, of destruction, of violence, I think probably some of us saw that, that, that heartbreaking video of that little Syrian boy, little four or five-year-old boy that had endured a, a bombing and he's bleeding and he's, he's shell-shocked and he can't, I don't know if you saw, it's heartbreaking, it's wrenching. I know that, the, that as much as that little boy needs Jesus, and he does, and his family, the solution to wars is broader than that. It's to take the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world, and then the end comes. That's got to be what drives us. It has to be our passion. If every believer on planet Earth did that, what would happen? In this age of mass communication, of social media, how can we not bring the kingdom to the ends of the earth? Here's an interesting perspective that I think might help you, and it helped me. At the writing of this book, this book by George Eldon Ladd, it was written in the 50s. And when he spoke of the gospel being preached to the whole world, he says, it's hard, it's problematic. People will say, well, this region's not even open to the gospel. And he specifically mentions China. It's not even open to the gospel. How are we going to solve the problem of China 50, 60 years ago? Now today, China is exploding with Christians. Hundreds of millions, too many to count because most of them are underground. It is exploding. The church is diminishing in the West. It's exploding in these other areas. That shows you the power of the Spirit of God. 
what theologians 60 years looked at and just said, we have no clue. I don't, we don't even know. That's, that's probably never going to happen. China is never going to happen. The Holy Spirit said, yes, it will. Amen. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, even China, even India, even Africa. That's the power of it. Our challenge is to live with the reality, whatever we believe from an eschatological perspective, and when he's returning, we live with the readiness that he is going to return. How many of us live like that? This is family time. We're all, you know, cozied around the fireplace, drinking little tea and saying, oh, I don't know, here's here's my little confession. I, I have to repent that I don't live with the anticipation that Jesus is coming back all the time. I wish I did. It's easy to sort of think about all of this in terms of sort of theoretical or, or ideological ways. Oh, he's coming one day. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to try to be a good guy and do good things and someday I'll go to heaven. Right? I mean, can we just be honest with ourselves? But living with the reality that one day he's going to ascend in power and victory, these extraordinary trumpets or whatever they are are going to be heard around the world simultaneously, and he's going to come on a cloud just like he ascended. I have no idea how that's going to look, but that's what's promised in Scripture when we've done this part. What would happen if every believer lived like that? looking for the return of Jesus, looking in the clouds going, where is this going to come from? It's extraordinary. If every believer did this every day of their lives, we just might see Jesus return in my lifetime or in your lifetime. I'm 50. I don't know how much time I got. Some of y'all are older, so you got even less. What if we lived like that? Now, what would it take? I can't preach to everybody. I can only preach to this congregation. But what would it take? What would that look like for us? Let's just, let's just look at what we do here, okay? Just for a second, what we do here. Now, obviously, I kind of get up and I preach. I, I have the gift of words. I have the gift of many, many words. I have a gift of many words to the, to the extent that I also have the gift, I have the spiritual gift of having people roll their eyes at me for, the, for my many, many words. Oh, will this guy ever stop? So I've been given the gift of teaching, and so I spend a lot of time up in front of people teaching. We tend to focus on that aspect. But let's take a look at what actually happens around here for this to happen. And let's just look at one week. Just one week. Um... Earlier this week, a bunch of good people, some musicians got together. They picked out some songs, figured out who was going to play, negotiated schedules and things, figured out what the best music, how we organize a meaningful worship set. They practiced really hard. They prayed so that there would be spiritual energy and momentum. Then they, then they led us all in worship. So that happened. We had teachers all throughout our 45, 50 youth teachers, you know, children's teachers and helpers that got curriculum, got their schedules, planned it out. They worked it all together so that they could coordinate different age groups, dozens and dozens of people so that our kids could learn about Jesus. That happened. Some good people because they were moved by the, all this is because they're moved by the spirit of God. God said, hey, I've got a task for you to do. I've got a task for you to do. Some good people because they have a task that God said, I've got a task for you to do. Some of, some of them went out and mowed the lawns. Weed whacked the, the, the uh, garden stuff, the plants, and trimmed them, pulled weeds, made the yard look good. Other people, um, because they were moved by the Holy Spirit, they pushed a vacuum cleaner around. They cleaned the building. They cleaned toilets. They made our place look great, our simple little church. Other people, because they were moved by the Spirit, they came in early, they put coffee on, they made some good cinnamon rolls. Other people worked hard, they gave a lot of money. By the way, there's, there's sort of been this rule that's existed that 
You either give or you serve. You don't usually do both. And to some extent, there's some truth in that. Sometimes people get really busy and they, they can't. They, they, they're high income earners and so they, they give. And then sometimes people are lower income earners and they serve. And, and that's probably true. But if you find yourself in that sort of world, if you're, if you're kind of giving, I want to encourage you to serve too. It'll make your giving more meaningful. And if you find yourself in the place where you're serving but not giving, I want you to learn to give. It'll make your serving more meaningful. But it takes, it, it, here's my point, it took dozens and dozens, and as we grow, it will take hundreds and hundreds of people to just do what we did this morning, let alone what we're going to do on Church on the Green, or if we take on a mission project, or we do discipleship training, it just takes dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people, hundreds of people, just, and, and this is just in our little church. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom, folks. It's everybody doing. This part here is just, just this little part. It takes dozens and dozens just in our little church. And I'm praying that someday there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of us mobilized by the kingdom. Not just consuming religious teaching and religious movie, uh, music and media, but doing the kingdom, gospeling in every aspect of their life. It doesn't mean you're going to necessarily get up and be a teacher, although some of you might, but you've got different giftings that are necessary. The gift of service, the gift of giving, the gift of leadership, prophetic gifts, evangelism gifts, all of the gifts of the Spirit, which we're going to help you find. In other words, it takes everybody to do this. If we're going to see our Lord Jesus return in my lifetime or the next, it takes all of us doing this. He promised he would. So if we're people of faith, we live with the expectation that maybe I'll see his return in my life, but only if I'm doing all that I can to hasten the kingdom. In the first century, it said they came, they came together and they committed themselves to the apostles' teachings, to gathering together of, of worshiping and building intentional redemptive relationships in prayer. We use it as a, a paraphrase of that, of Acts 2.42 in our vision statement. We envision a church that commits themselves to God's word, God's people, intentional relationships, and prayer. Everybody, every day, committing themselves to God's word, God's people, intentional relationships, and prayer. Every single day. That's what the kingdom is. In other words, in whatever capacity you're in, you're going to seek his kingdom first, knowing that all other things are added to you. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a great church? Wouldn't it be great if every single person at Cross Point Church, when their head hit the pillow at night, they could say, I did the kingdom today. I gospeled. I gospeled. Do people see a kingdom person when they see you in your work environment? If you're a boss, when you boss them, do they see the kingdom? If you're, an employ if you're employed, when, when your boss sees you, do they see the kingdom? When your fellow workers, whatever it is in academia, do they see the kingdom in you? Wouldn't it be great if in every aspect of our lives people did? They saw the kingdom in our recreation, in our work, in our studies. That'd be powerful. Everybody, every day, committing themselves to God's word, God's people, relationships like this, intentional redemptive relationships. If you don't have intentional redemptive relationships, you gotta get them. Not people that beat you up. I'm not talking about that. People that will pull the best out of you. Who are the people in your life that are pulling the best out of you, that are challenging you in areas of weakness, strengthening you in areas of strength, making you the best, best person you can be? You need those relationships, and I need them too. And prayer, prayer. More and more and more, I'm teaching people to pray, and we're learning to pray with greater and greater depth. We're getting beyond the checklists, learning to hear God, learning to be directed by him. Wouldn't it be great if every person did that every single day? Everybody, every day, committing themselves to God's word, God's people, intentional relationships and prayer. Now that would be a church. Say that with me. Everybody every day. Say it again. Everybody, every day. Say it like you mean it. Everybody, every day. That's the kingdom. People don't do the kingdom for you. 
You have to do it yourself. Amen? Let's be that church. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.